afternoon and welcome from wherever you're joining us from uh, around the world. Uh, this is an East African uh, Commission uh, webinar, uh, but we've seen uh, people joining us from all over the world. Uh, welcome so much uh, from wherever you are. Uh, my name is Kiondo Wawero. Um, um, I will be your moderator this afternoon, um, based here in Nairobi. It's a uh, warm afternoon, and we're very grateful uh, to be having this webinar. Uh, again, uh, from the East African Commission, uh, we have governments uh, from Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi uh, presented, uh, represented, sorry. And uh, to this afternoon, uh, we'll be talking about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on wildlife conservation in East Africa. Uh, but uh, we'll go beyond that uh, because as we know, Mother Africa is a resilient uh, continent. Uh, so we also be looking at the responses uh, that uh, all the respective governments have put in place uh, to see that uh, we are able uh, to recover from these hard times uh, from this pandemic. Uh, again, I'll be your moderator. Uh, my name is Kiondo Wawero. I work uh, with Earth Internews, Earth Journalism Network, which is a global network of uh, media practitioners. Uh, we train and uh, empower media all over the world uh, to be able uh, to tell stories on the environment, wildlife, and conservation. Uh, I lead a project here in East Africa. And you can find us more about us on earthjournalism.net. Uh, again, uh, in this webinar, uh, I'm joined uh, from uh, uh, from East African uh, Commission, uh, uh, which are nations from the East Africa, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and South Sudan, although we don't have uh, uh, South Sudan and Tanzania on the panelists today, but they are well represented uh, from by uh, our speakers today, the East African Commission. Uh, but before we go there, uh, there are a few ground rules. Uh, when you're coming in as a tenant, uh, you on mute and you're not on video. Uh, so we'll be doing presentations for the first uh, one hour. And uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, you can see a few icons. There is a chat icon and there is a Q&A icon. Uh, so please, we really have, uh, we've given time uh, to do questions and answers. We would want to answer all your questions, but to help us do this, uh, you need to put your questions, not on the chat, but on the questions and answer. Uh, kindly give us your name, uh, tell us where you are from, uh, tell us your organization, and most importantly, uh, direct your question uh, to a particular, uh, to a particular uh, presenter uh, from, uh, from these uh, panelists. Uh, again, uh, to our speakers uh, this afternoon, uh, we're glad that you're able to join us. Uh, this is indeed you know, a very high level uh, panel, panel uh, representation uh, from the African governments. And I will also recognize uh, the presence of uh, the director for uh, South Africa region, IUCN, and also we have the environment uh, director from USAID, Aurelio Miko, who will be giving us uh, the remarks at the tail end uh, of the presentations. Uh, but now I would like us to go to our first uh, presentation uh, that we come from the East African uh, community, uh, represented by the Honorable Christophe uh, Bazivamo, uh, the Deputy Secretary General, Productive and Social Sectors uh, for the East African community. Uh, Honorable Christophe, uh, I'll be sharing your screen now, and uh, uh, we can start uh, whenever you, 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 you're ready. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, especially uh, colleagues, panelists from USAID, IUCN, WWF, traffic, and others. First of all, let me thank you for attending this uh, uh, conversation, especially when we speak about wildlife management and also tourism in region. I wish to say that uh, ESC, you know, is one of the 80 uh, regional economic community in Africa. And we are happy to inform that uh, Africa Regional Integration Index 2019 
has again ranked East Africa as the best performing when it comes to integration. We are doing well, and this was the same in 2018, and we are happy we have not gone backward in 2019. But I fear maybe for 2020, we shall have challenges, but so far, so good. So I wish again to say that uh, our community, which is East African community, you know, is an integration process, an integration which is ba uh, based on four pillars, the customs union, the common market, the monetary union, and then the political federation. You know that under the customs union, we are implementing the single customs territory, where normally it is supposed to have a free movement of goods uh, throughout the East African community. And we are progressing well in that area uh, in normally, but in this period of COVID, we have actually had some challenges which I shall speak about. And when it comes to the common market, we are implementing the free movement of people, free movement of capital, labor, services, and tourism, you know, for Zanda services. And we are speaking about seeing East Africa as a, a, a common tourism destination, single tourism destination. And you know, we have a East African tourism visa to help in that process. But so far, there are also documents which have, have been developed uh, targeting uh, actually achieving this uh, uh, wish. Uh, in, of our community. I wish also to highlight that the fact that uh, tourism, wildlife management, is seen under the treaty for the establishment of the East African community. And this we find it under Article 114 and 116. And under 114, partner states agree to take concerted measures to foster cooperation in the joint and efficient management and sustainable utilization of natural resources within the community for mutual benefit for all the partner states. In under Article 116, as you see, partner states have undertaken to develop a collective and a coordinated policy for conservation and sustainable utilization of wildlife and other tourism sites in the community. And under this, the thought are about harmonizing policies on wildlife conservation, exchange of information, coordinate efforts in controlling and monitoring uh, all activities uh, around fight against encroachment and poaching. And uh, now I wish also to inform that uh, actually we have developed this uh, East African community uh, strategy uh, in this area of anti-poaching. So I wish also to highlight the fact that uh, when it comes to value of wildlife tourists globally and regionally, uh, this is slide three, which uh, you have to move. We see how actually important is this sector. Move to the next slide. The sector is very important, especially because it contributes a lot in uh, uh, the incomes from uh, the wildlife tourism in uh, the whole world where we have almost 120 billion. When it comes to East Africa, we speak that uh, ESC, this will be the slide number four. You can move two times. ESC hosts a quarter of four protected area in Africa. So I don't see you moving. You can, uh, yes, you are there. And ESC is home of uh, uh, actually the greatest global concentration of uh, large mammals in both protected and non-protected area, where we have 
about 28% of uh, known elephants of the continent in our region. And uh, you, you know, these are statistics which show that uh, tourism sector contributes to around 9% of uh, uh, GDP of our partner state, 8% when it comes to jobs creation, and also almost uh, 20, let's say 19% when it comes to uh, the export uh, earnings. We know also that a big percentage of international tourists, about 70%, uh, who come to the region, come just to visit parks, to visit uh, reserves, to visit wildlife, wildlife areas. So to say, it's important to know that our region, when it comes to wildlife, the contribution is big to our East African community economies. And we would say that uh, we have uh, what, uh, let's say, what uh, wonders, where you have uh, like uh, the Serengeti National Park, Masai Mara, Ngorongoro Conservation Area, uh, Amboseri National Park, Gorilla Viewing in Rwanda and Uganda. So actually, it's important to highlight that this sector plays a very big role for our economies. And it is important to consider that uh, in this period where we are facing uh, uh, COVID, we are actually very affected. I wish to say that uh, we have developed this uh, regional strategy to combat poaching and illegal with the life trade where we are working together with uh, our partners, USAID, IUCN, WAD, WWF, Traffic Environmental Incentives, uh, among others. So we can say we were moving away, well uh, around this strategy, which had key, uh, six key strategic pillars including strengthening policy and legal frameworks, enhancing law enforcement capacities, strengthening international and regional collaboration, promoting education and public awareness about uh, wildlife crime, promote research development, and increase capacity of local communities to pursue sustainable uh, livelihoods. And here, I wish to emphasize the fact that uh, actually it should be a must to ensure uh, local communities are involved in uh, all or whatever we do to protect uh, uh, wildlife. Uh, otherwise, it, is, it does not it become sustainable. Uh, partner states have also developed national strategies to combat poaching. And what I want now to highlight in slide number uh, six, if you can move to there, is the impact of COVID in our region, which is a very serious impact. We have seen really uh, very big challenges. When we see travel restrictions, such as cancellation of international flights, closure of borders and lockdowns that have been imposed by government towards containment of COVID-19, this has uh, had a serious negative impact on tourism in this area of wildlife management and conservation. You know, globally, it is estimated that tourism will reduce by between 58% and 78%, depending on when this restriction will stop. But at the East African community level, it was estimated at about 40%. But uh, this considering uh, or expecting this uh, uh, to be uh, stopped in June, July, it means uh, having a, a removal of restrictions in June, July. But from what we see, maybe it will not be possible. And we will face uh, for that reason actually more serious impact and this can drop up to 
Vous savez, au Fafrican Safari 3, opérateur, on va over 90% of them experienced declines of greater than 75% in bookings, and many indicated that they had no booking at all. So it is actually a serious situation which has resulted in two uh, losses, losses in tourism revenue, and this, of course, is indirectly uh, impacting uh, the East African community citizens living in these uh, different areas. We have seen losses of tourism and conservation related jobs, and this is a serious uh, area because we know this tourism sector uh, employs a lot of people, and when you have this kind of restriction, then the losses are uh, big. We have losses of revenue for local communities who were used to benefit from revenue sharing schemes for conservation in the region. We have been seeing an increase in livelihood losses, leading to increased poaching, especially for bushmeat. And this is a concern, of course. And then in the national parks, reserves, and other wildlife areas, you have seen that they have been affected due to reduced funding because nobody is investing there now. And uh, measures which were taken to stop the spread of the pandemic have automatically actually impacted also on uh, what we are doing in that sector. And uh, of course, this all is due to reduced foreign aid. You know, there is no more investment in that area, no more support in that time. And it is the reason why actually through even these discussions, we will be trying to call upon whoever to try to see how this sector can be supported. Of course, West African community seen the COVID problem has taken some measures uh, to address the spread of the pandemic and also to see how to ease the free movement of uh, services and people, people not easily, but goods throughout the borders in East Africa. We have uh, at original level one health approach, we have a platform, but we have also uh, put in place an East African community uh, uh, regional COVID coordination committee, which has come up with the uh, development of uh, East African community COVID uh, response plan. And uh, we have been able to organize meetings of ministers, uh, especially ministers in charge of health, uh, East African community affairs, and uh, also uh, trade to come up with some resolutions which could help the East African community to move as a region in trying to address the problems faced due to COVID-19. These meetings which were held have also uh, uh, come up with some regional guidelines, especially when it comes to uh, travel arrangement in the region, especially for goods. And uh, later on, we have uh, actually been able to have a consultative summit of head state. We have uh, met uh, on 12th of May and uh, actually took some serious recommendations. And one of these uh, uh, decisions uh, was to put in place on East African community electronic uh, uh, cargo and drivers uh, uh, COVID-19 tracker system, which is uh, actually being implemented uh, uh, now from, uh, let's say, to, to, to uh, to, today, the testings have been very successful, and uh, we expect for the next coming weeks, the issue will be to have uh, or agreed upon uh, East African uh, test result certificate, which will be uh, accepted in all partner states, and this will help actually movement of goods and services throughout the East African community. Uh, this being uh, a kind of 
building mutual trust between our partner state. And here I wish also to highlight the fact that uh, uh, we have developed uh, recovery plans in the region and uh, uh, we are working on uh, one on tourism, but we have got one uh, on uh, uh, trade uh, remedies, which uh, also includes uh, tourism sector as a service. And this one is, uh, uh, has been seen by the ministers in charge of uh, uh, finance. We have met recently on, 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 on a video conference uh, to come up with solutions, especially on how to ease uh, uh, and help SMEs, uh, to help uh, even the tourism sector uh, by measures on taxation, by measures uh, or package uh, which can help the different sectors to, uh, to, 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 to build resilience and uh, uh, to try to recover uh, after the COVID, but uh, we say normally it will begin during this COVID because we do not expect this to, to, to be concluded uh, tomorrow. And COVID will be there. So uh, I wish to say that in the same process, we have uh, uh, organized at East African community level trainings, trainings of uh, uh, airport staff, because you are saying uh, it is important to think about uh, reopening airports, and it is the reason why you have uh, actually, with uh, AMREF, uh, we have been training airport staff that they can address uh, and manage the situation when uh, travel, uh, air travel rebegin. So this is still ongoing. It has been done in Kenya, Mombasa, Nairobi, uh, Zanzibar, and it is now uh, doing, uh, being done in other partner states. So we are proposing uh, interventions and uh, some kind of recommendations uh, to come up maybe with a kind of resilience in this post-COVID recovery, uh, post-COVID uh, period, but of course, as I have said in the beginning, we cannot speak about post-COVID because we don't know exactly when it will end. And we say, let us try to do whatever possible to build resilience. And now we are requesting, uh, or we have even requested through the ministers of uh, finance uh, meetings to support tourism SMEs, community-based conservation initiative, uh, and to look into which kind of packages can be put in place to help actually all these uh, different sectors who are suffering to, to recover. When it comes to diversity conservation revenue stream, we are thinking also, come back, we are thinking, thinking also on uh, enhancing promotion of regional and domestic tourism to national parks and uh, reserves as we wait for the international travel to pick up. We are speaking on uh, development of management plans, zonings, and establishing carrying capacity to wildlife conservation areas uh, so that we can help the sector to, to move forward. The issue of one health approach will continue, and also the capacity building we have spoken about will be also uh, uh, we will, we will continue. We think that uh, it will be important to develop original wildlife policy to provide uh, a, co a coordinated approach, uh, especially in this recovery process. So there are measures which are taken globally in the East African community uh, to address actually uh, trade as trade remedies. There are also uh, measures which are taken globally to address uh, uh, problems we have, we have got in uh, SMEs to help them to recover and to help uh, actually like the uh, hotels, uh, the tourism tours to, 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 to have maybe a kind of 
building resilience and to, to recover. These are measures which are taken uh, especially in global, but we are supposed to speak to some specific for the tourism sector and wildlife management. But I um, wish again so much. to, to yes. emphasize that uh, this is a sector which has, uh, uh, which has suffered uh, most in the East African community. And when it comes to finding solutions, you have to focus on it because it is really a kind of fragile sector uh, in this COVID period. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Christophe, uh, for that candid uh, presentation. And indeed, I know we'll come more into that uh, about tourism and recovery measures uh, because I can see a lot of uh, questions coming uh, on these. Uh, but please allow us uh, to go to the other uh, presentations and then we can have uh, a session for Q and A's. Uh, good afternoon here from Nairobi. I see more people, participants are joining us from around the world. Um, uh, you're watching a, a webinar organized by the East African uh, community, uh, member states, and uh, looking into the impact uh, of COVID on wildlife conservation and the solutions uh, that the respective governments have put, and we'll be uh, hearing about these. If you're just joining us, uh, please, I can see a lot of people putting their questions on the chat. Uh, we are not able to archive that or even allow, uh, be able to ask those questions. Can you please look at the bottom of your screen and see there is a Q&A icon and a chat. If you could kindly put your questions on Q&A and direct them to the specific um, uh, speaker that you'd like to answer your query. Uh, again, I'd like to recognize that we have, uh, uh, our primary target here was the media, the reporters, and I see we are being joined uh, by a good number uh, from across Africa. I kindly know that we are recording uh, this webinar and it will be shared on uh, artjournalism.net uh, and also uh, by the East African community and the respective uh, countries presented here today. And all the presentations will be able to, uh, to be available to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and now uh, we look into the impact of COVID-19 on wildlife conservation and what uh, East African uh, community partner states uh, are going. And we'll go uh, from Tanzania, uh, from the uh, ESC, or Rabo Christoph. And now we go to uh, Brigadier Retired uh, General Wawero, uh, the, direct, uh, the Director General for the Kenya Wildlife uh, Service, uh, to give us an outlook. Uh, of the uh, uh, the Kenyan aspect, and uh, if you allow me, Brigadier, I'll go ahead and share your screen. Yes, please. And say you. And sit. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, kindly, I would request if you would let me know if I when I can move to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, namesake. <laughs> the same chair, <laughs> Thank you. The same chair. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> Thank and, you. Uh, w welcome, uh, panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, or the attendees. I'll try to keep mine very, very short indeed. Um, I will just give you a snapshot of what's going on uh, within Kenya Wildlife Service and Kenya uh, as uh, regards the effect of COVID. On, uh, on the wildlife conservation in Kenya. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, I just want to give you a very quick synopsis here, just to tell you what area we're looking at. Go back, please. Yes, there, thank you very much. Uh, this is just a, a, a pen picture, very quickly telling you the area that uh, Kenya Wildlife Service is responsible for. Uh, you can see on the left the, on the map, uh, those are the, you see how scattered, uh, the national parks, national reserves, marine uh, national parks, marine national reserves, and national sanctuaries are scattered uh, all over the country. We have 160 conservancies. These conservancies are actually outside national parks and reserves. Uh, 28 terrestrial national reserves, 23 terrestrial national parks, uh, six marine reserves, six national sanctuaries, and four marine parks. So that is the area of responsibility for the Kenya Wildlife Service. Next slide, please.
So what has been the effect of COVID-19 on uh, uh, wildlife management or conservation in Kenya? Uh, we've had a 92% significant drop in revenue. That's internal revenue uh, has declined by 92% since COVID-19. Uh, and that is since March this year. We've had a drop in visitor numbers by 76%. Uh, specifically, 98% drop in non-resident visitors. And uh, you can see the relationship between the uh, non-resident visitors and the drop in revenue, because the two are related. Uh, we've had an increase uh, of threats. Remember, we must be specific, threats to poaching okay, of endangered species and threats of transnational crime through porous borders. So that is, that is a threat that we've had, although we're managing the threat uh, quite, quite well. The other problem we have right now, and we've seen an increase in, is uh, bushmeat poaching and associated crime. And then we've had an increase of human wildlife conflict uh, due to the, I think, the influx of people to the rural areas because of the, some of the areas before the lockdown. But then we are seeing an increase in this, uh, where also we are having animals roam more freely at night uh, than uh, before. So we've had uh, elephants go into populated areas, uh, cats, uh, lions, leopards, and so on. Next slide, please. So what has been our response? The response to COVID-19. Uh, within uh, KWS premises and uh, parks and reserves, we have a mandatory, mandatory daily screening of staff and visitors. We also have a wellness center that is located at the headquarter and also all other main conservation areas. And there are eight conservation areas sp spread throughout the country so that we can then cater for cases that arise uh, from the pandemic. We have set up a toll-free number uh, as shown on the screen where people can communicate if at all there is an issue and we need to respond to it. We have enhanced our communication and information sharing within the tourism industry. We have allowed 16% uh, of our staff to work virtually while the remaining 84% in active areas to be on duty. Maybe I need to explain this a little. These are 84% are not people working in offices. Uh, remember Kenya Wildlife Service is uh, also uh, para, okay, uh, paramilitary and we have a lot of rangers uh, on active duties in sanctuaries, parks and reserves who need to remain there. So maybe you might have expected it to be the other way around, but we need to have our rangers on the ground uh, to be able to protect uh, wildlife and uh, carry on with our conservation uh, uh, activities. We also provide uh, sanitizers, dispensers, disinfectants, and have hired health care providers to all our units. And strategic engagement with government and partners. We, uh, I know there was a question being asked right now about what government has done with regard to uh, supporting uh, the Kenya Wildlife Service uh, because of the loss in revenue. And I'll mention that as we go on. Please, next slide. So, the next slide, please. So, what is uh, the during, during post or in COVID and post-COVID scenario, what do we see? Number one, the current product that we have in place uh, uh, or pre-COVID is not and does will not appeal uh, to the changes in the new, new rules of social distancing, uh, health guidelines and restrictions. So clearly that product needs to change. International borders and boundaries will remain closed during the COVID-19 pandemic period and even during the post-COVID period. So what do we expect in the post-COVID period? Major international travel restrictions 
for more than at least a year before we can see a change in the revenues. Uh, you know, so we, our estimate is that, uh, and we are beginning our financial year in July next month. During that period, we do not see any change as far as uh, international uh, travelers and visitors, visitation is concerned. So we need to target domestic and regional markets. And I'm really happy to have my colleagues from the region uh, because we must now begin to talk to each other uh, with regard to addressing the regional market. Local traveling and experiences will be the new normal. And we must now begin to redefine ourselves with the new normal. And we also must focus and we, we in Kenya, and I believe it will probably apply to our partner countries uh, in the East African region, we need to focus on the millennials, but we must give them different tastes and preferences because they demand that. So we must look at the future generation uh, and the millennials right now, because those are the people who will be coming to our parks and reserves and enjoy this God-given gift that we have uh, and uh, we are maintaining for them. Now, what are the post-COVID interventions? Next slide, please. The post-COVID inter interventions, we must strengthen our communication and marketing. That we have to do. And as I said, that would be to the local market and the regional market. We must, as I mentioned earlier, the product we have is not suitable anymore. So we must rebrand that product so that we get a different product that appeals to the market that we are targeting. We also must use technology. And technology will help us to, uh, by way of modernizing our operations, so that we can use technology as a force multiplier, multiplier particularly when it comes to uh, our protection of uh, endangered species. We must focus on strategic partnerships. And this is actually what I'm talking about with regard to our East African brothers and sisters, to be able to come together, to be able to enhance our strategic partnerships. We need to explore other sources of revenue. So the traditional sources of revenue, we have to go back to the drawing table and actually explore other sources of revenue. And number six, engagements like we are doing now, these are very important because then we'll be able to inform the general public through webinars and engagement with them so as to be able to get the feel of what they would want and how they would want to see the product that they would love to come and visit in our parks and reserves. That brings me to the end of my presentation. I wanted to keep it very short. I know there are a lot of specific questions, but uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody. And I look forward to the engagement on the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Director General for Kenya Wildlife Service uh, for that you know, a very uh, a well put out um, presentation. I've come out uh, with several things uh, that of course we'll discuss during the Q&A. Uh, it's good to see that uh, over 80% uh, 80 of our rangers are still working to protect our wild, uh, although you have uh, uh, shown that there are threats uh, to these. And also, you know, your acknowledgement uh, of uh, this new normal, you know, uh, changing the package of tourism to make it attractive to more young people, and also, you know, uh, embracing these kind of technologies like we're doing with the webinars, because all of us now are not able to meet in person. Uh, so I'll also go, uh, we hear from Rwanda, uh, but for this one, uh, we would have uh, a presentation. Uh, I will pose a question uh, to Eugene uh, Mtangana. Uh, who is the conservation uh, uh, conservation management expert uh, uh, for the Rwanda Development Board? Um, Changana, uh, I'll ask you uh, this question. Uh, the impact of COVID on tourism has had far-reaching implications on conservation of wildlife resources across the globe. How do you describe the actual situation in your country 
in terms of the change of or impact already seen on wildlife conservation since the outbreak uh, of this pandemic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can do. Uh, uh, I do. You go on, please. Okay. Oh, okay. well, um, uh, I would like to just go straight to next uh, slides. Uh, that is just a mission of conservation of biodiversity in Rwanda, which is uh, 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 biodiversity of Rwanda for sustainable development of, of the country and as uh, <clears throat> international heritage through the implementation of protected ecology principles and the promotion promotion of strategic partnerships with uh, <clears throat> communities and other, uh, other partners. May you go to the next? Uh... Uh, yep. I think so. Okay. You yeah. can yeah. do that. Sorry, I have control of the, of, of the screen, sorry. So um, that is just like a, a background of what a conservation is in Rwanda. Rwanda has put nature conservation at the center of economic uh, development. For the last seven consecutive years, tourism has uh, been ranked as um, first foreign currency uh, earner. Uh, that means uh, on top of any other, other thing, coffee, mining. So tourism um, brings us uh, much more foreign currency. This industry is at uh, more than 80% 80, uh, 80 uh, nature based and um, four national parks make the key uh, of the uh, Rwanda tourism destination management areas. We don't have that much, but we have uh, these uh, few remaining uh, nature or intact nature places um, in Rwanda, having uh, Akagela in the east. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mr. Mtangana. Have we lost you? I think we've lost uh, Mr. Mtangana there. Uh, let me give him a minute. Um, hello, Eugene, can you hear me? Uh, Stefano, uh, if you could unmute uh, Eugene. Yes. Okay. I've unmuted. You, you're good. Uh, you can continue. Yes. Okay, please. Okay. So I, I think uh, I got lost when I was on a point of uh, where tourism plays a major role in the, in the country's economy, contributing 10% to the GDP and 8% to off-farm uh, uh, employment. So that's what uh, actually uh, tourism contributes um, to, the, to the economy of, of Rwanda. In, nine, uh, in 2019, Rwanda received uh, 1.6 63 million visitors and national parks counted uh, 111,136 visitors with uh, the four national parks contributing or generating uh, about 29 million US dollars. Uh, this is just a background of our national parks, the ones that I've just mentioned. Uh, we have a Volcanoes National Park that was created in 1925. 
Uh, it's a rainforest uh, with a size of um, 160 square kilometers, uh, very small. Akagera National Park that was created in 1934, a savanna park with uh, 1,122 uh, 1, square kilometers. That is in the east, pure savanna where we have um, the big five. Uh, Nyungwe National Park that was created in 2005. A rain for, it's a, rain, a pure rainforest, the biggest actually in the eastern central Africa. And then Gishwati Mukura National Park that was created recently in, 20, in, in 2016 with a smallest size of uh, just 35.6 square kilometers. The total, um, uh, the total uh, protected areas uh, make 80.9 of the whole country uh, devoted to conservation. The majority of the rest is located in national parks. Of course, uh, outside we have less on, on land. Uh, and then national parks managed within uh, uh, the broader system, uh, ecosystems of, of, of landscapes. So going straight to the, to the impact of COVID-19, um, uh, COVID uh, the park management is, is conducted through different areas, including ecological monitoring, law enforcement, and poaching. Tourism development and management uh, of uh, management, uh, tourism development and management, community partnership and eco ecosystem health. Uh, this 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 comprises our programs at our protected areas, and uh, the the COVID nineteen pandemic imposed the freezing of uh, different services, and Rwanda took decisive actions to limit the spread of COVID and ensure the health of its uh, citizens, visitors, and wildlife. So we have, um, we, since the, the, the pandemic, uh, tourism was halt or stopped uh, in national parks and all research activities. We, prior stopping, we had um, put all the possible measures and uh, screening of uh, every visitor and staff to, to national parks. Uh, we also, um, you know, applied uh, washing stations at all entry points, uh, sanitizing. Uh, we also increased actually the size of uh, visiting um, uh, gorillas. I saw a question uh, uh, on that. We've, uh, we've moved from seven, uh, uh, we moved from seven meters to 10 meters. And uh, we also applied uh, a mandatory uh, mask wearing uh, to all visitors, uh, all those that visit, visit, uh, uh, visit gor uh, gorillas and chimpanzees. And uh, we also tested, um, we've actually, we've tested all uh, our, our na national park staff, uh, just uh, in, to be sure that uh, uh, protection of uh, wildlife is, uh, is, is ensured. Um, the tourism and research activities, I said, they put, they've, been, they've been put on halt. Uh, though of recent, uh, we, are, we are recovering, just uh, that I will talk uh, probably at the end, how we are trying to maneuver and, uh, you know, uh, starting again uh, the life of tourism and conservation in national parks. Uh, community support projects were suspended and only law enforcement activities were sustained though at a, a lowered pace. Um, with law enforcement, we, we had to, to make uh, whoever on duty, and those are rangers and, uh, and, and truckers, they had to stay at their particular uh, pat uh, patrol posts. Uh, we applied all the measures, uh, sanitizing before uh, and after, uh, wearing of, of masks, and we divided the team into two. Uh, one team uh, was held at home, and uh, the one uh, uh, on duty, the ones that were staying at patrol posts, they would only uh, walk, go to the park, do the usual tracking uh, patrols, and then come back to the patrol posts, uh, and were like um, uh, in isolation. Uh, they never went to their families, nor did they uh, went to other communities. So that's how it worked. And every time we wanted to switch, the, 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 team, that, um, the, the team that would uh, come to uh, Lee Place, they would be first put in a quarantine of 14 days and then be tested and then uh, raised to go on, on duty. 
um, suspension of all tourism activities has, has heavily impacted uh, on, on, on different economic sectors in, in the country, including conservation and tourism product development activities, which were mainly funded for tourism revenues. Um, for this year, for example, the community projects that are funded through revenue sharing, uh, there'll, be, there'll be no funding. Uh, and then, of course, uh, having stopped uh, tools and revenues that uh, support uh, that support the, the the operations of the park, the government has to step in to uh, bridge the gap uh, to fund the operations that continued uh, law enforcement uh, um, patrolling, and uh, no major changes uh, when it comes to illegal activities that are, that have that have been realized. So the, these are likely to reduce at um, uh, 70 uh, to 80 of this year, and the impact may last longer. We actually, uh, we've started uh, tourism again, and that is domestic tourism. Uh, and then um, when we talk of domestic tourism, we talk of Rwandans and then uh, 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 foreign residents in Rwanda, and then also open to private uh, jets and, uh, and chartered uh, flights. And those are uh, internationals, the only internationals that can fly in uh, for now that are open to our airport and then also open to our national parks. But we've uh, strengthened, uh, strengthened our uh, preventive measures by actually uh, requesting uh, uh, a certificate to be presented um, that has been done in 14 days before visiting uh, uh, day. And then also uh, when on arrival, testing is mandatory and uh, results uh, uh, would be available in uh, eight hours. And that's how we're managing. Uh, and the usual national uh, uh, preventive measures um, are continuing in place. Uh, during this period, uh, maintenance uh, uh, of acti uh, activities were uh, suspended, like I said. Community members, especially small hold businesses, were heavily affected. Uh, of course, the adjacent uh, businesses uh, that depended on uh, tourism uh, and which tourism depends on nature and yet we uh, we stopped that means all that chain has uh, suffered uh, a lot the suppliers to uh, eco lodges high end lodges the 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 staff and etc all those have been uh, affected heavily by the the pandemic uh, tourism related businesses depend uh, the and dependent activities were hit. Uh, that is what I said exactly. And then um, there is a risk of uh, increased level of, uh, of, of poaching. The, the communities, um, though uh, the, the, the Rwandan government is trying so hard that um, the impact is lessened or the, the, the problem is, is, is actually curbed, but still we see uh, more numbers uh, trying to to, to raise when it comes to, to poaching, but uh, not so not so much. But uh, and this is uh, around uh, all the national parks like Kigera, Nyungwe, uh, Volcanoes, and uh, and Gishwati. Hello, Mr. Eugene, can I? Uh, can I so the, Hello, the recovery. Eugene. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah. uh, would you allow me to stop you there, please? Uh, because time is. I really on our side, and I will uh, ask you a question before you go uh, on the poaching side. I have a question uh, that I think we need to address uh, before we move on uh, from anonymous attendee who is asking, is there a statistical rise in number of wildlife crime since March 2020? If so, what are the numbers and percent or percentages? And since that was your last uh, statement before this slide, uh, would you allow me to ask you that question and then you take us uh, through two minutes and, and then we move to the next part kindly uh great uh, thank you thank you so much the the poaching like i said the the, the, the uh, majority of poachers in rwanda it's not commercial it's just uh, 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 traditional uh, bush meat uh, and we see it um, um, not so much raising uh, a slight increase. And uh, of course, uh, what we do is uh, much to raise awareness with the communities. Uh, 
however much we would tighten inside law enforcement, that wouldn't help alone. And the strategy is uh, so much coming very close, close to, to the communities, uh, having the groups that uh, volunteer to, uh, to, give inform to share information and, uh, and then also, of course, uh, dialogues, talkings um, in communities that help much. So that is uh, what we, we are emphasizing right now. Uh, and then, of course, uh, um, there's that uh, challenge that uh, right now, no, 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 no projects in, uh, with the revenue sharing that have been funded this year. And probably we don't know how this will go even next year. But uh, yeah, we, we pray that uh, the situation recovers uh, quickly and uh, incentives to the communities again uh, alive. Thank you so much uh, for that. Before you, you go into recovery measures, which I hope you can kindly do that with one minute or two minutes max. Uh, after you present, I'll ask uh, the same question to Honorable uh, Christophe uh, from ESC and uh, the DG, uh, KWS Kenya, about the same questions about the numbers that we're seeing for uh, wildlife. Uh, do we have numbers? Do we have statistics? Uh, before then, we move to Ugandan uh, presentation. Thank you. You can go ahead, uh, Mr. Eugene. Thank you so much. Just like I said in a nutshell, uh, I will summarize. We, we've, we've come back with, uh, with um, uh, starting with uh, tr uh, domestic tourism, uh, Rwandans uh, 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 visiting our national parks are uh, open, and then uh, national or foreign residents in Rwanda. And uh, for example, uh, we, we have uh, actually even applied or put some discounts especially on gorilla uh, am i cut off um I, I i don't know what happened um uh, but, but that's okay <laughs> i think we can address that uh, when we come to the q and a uh, if you don't mind uh, we, uh could, i can go back could we stop there <laughs> okay yes please and okay. uh, and and because I see a lot of questions uh, also addressed to uh, to the recovery measures, uh, we'll kindly come to these. Uh, but before we go uh, to Uganda, can we hear kindly from uh, uh, Brigadier uh, Wawero and also from Honorable Christophe um, on this question about uh, if you have statistics already? Uh, may may I kick off? <clears throat> yes, please. Yes, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, yes, uh, the threats uh, as far as uh, the poaching is concerned of uh, endangered species was a threat. And I thought I mentioned that it was a threat. We have not seen any uh, increase, significant increase other than that of uh, one poaching incident of uh, an elephant earlier, I think it was around April. Uh, as far as bushmeat is concerned, yes, those we have, I don't have all the, the data, but I'll get it before we, when we come to the q and I'll be able to give you some of the data uh, in uh, some of the species, but we have had a, a significant increase in bushmeat, and you're talking about giraffe, uh, antelope, uh, dig dig, uh, and so on and so forth. That, that we've seen a large increase in, and I can give you some statistics when you come to the q and I'll be able to deliver that to you. Thank you, um, Director General. I hope that helps. I hope that helps. <laughs> it it, no, yes, it does. Yes. And um, uh, could we hear from Honorable Christophe Bazivamo from the East African community? Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, normally what we get is a, a kind of compilation of what is happening uh, in partner states. And so far, when it comes to poaching, in a, it's really terms, we do not have, uh, uh, let's say, increase as such of this kind of activities. What we see is also this kind of uh, bush meat, as I said. But when it comes to poaching activities, we cannot speak about any increase caused by COVID. Thank you. OK, thank you so much. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, anonymous <laughs> attendee. I hope you heard your name and uh, from where you you joining us from. And now I uh, will go directly uh, to Uganda and we hear from 
uh, Sam Wanda, who's the executive director of the Uganda Wildlife Authority. Um, sir, I hope you are able to do this um, in about five minutes uh, because we are really running out of time. We need to go to Q and A. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Waweru and uh, Sam Manda is the name, the Executive Director of Uganda Wildlife Authority. Uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are, our listeners, and thank you, panelists and organizers. I'll be as brief as possible um, and tell you that Uganda is the pearl of Africa, it is gifted by nature. It has an extremely rich biodiversity, uh, both terrestrial and aquatic. And uh, there are various species that are diverse, uh, including the famous mount gor mountain gorilla and the chimpanzees. Next. Mr. next slide. Mm -hmm. There. Uh, that map is what I want you to focus on, if you can see it. The reds are national parks, there are 10 of them. The greens that are big are wildlife reserves. Uh, there are 12 of them. Then the small things that look like dots all over the map are actually all forest reserves. Now, Uganda Wildlife Authority is responsible for the national parks and wildlife reserves. And there are a little bit of yellows, if you can see them just five of them. Those are community wildlife areas that belong to the community, but are used for conservation of wildlife. Now, when you look up the national parks and the wildlife reserves, uh, they take up about 10% of the country, uh, but we collaborate very closely with the National Forest Authority because it is habitat to a lot of wildlife. And so we must work together to ensure that the wildlife in there are conserved. The next slide, please. Uh, due to the rich biodiversity, most of the tourism we have in Uganda is predominantly nature-based, and the tourism sector therefore has a big contribution to GDP. Uh, with our revenue generated in 2019, uh, estimated at 1.6 billion US dollars from tourism, and uh, there are four uh, tourism being important in the economy of the country. About 670,000 Ugandans are employed directly, uh, either in hotels or in wildlife management or uh, something related, and there are four uh, playing a very important part in the economy of the country. Now, for Uganda Wildlife Authority, you need to know is 90% of our revenue and our budget comes from tourism activities. And so if there is a problem with tourism, there is a problem with our activities. Next slide, please. Um, what has the, been the impact of COVID on wildlife conservation in Uganda? First of all, travel restrictions uh, curtailed movements of everybody in, on the globe, uh, but also within Uganda, there is a period when nobody was moving anywhere. Uh, now that has been lifted, but there are still areas that are forbidden because of the kind of level of COVID infections in those areas. Our visitations are about 25,000 people per month. Uh, visiting our parks. And so when you close the 25,000, you're closing our revenue and the local economies are, close, are also collapsing because they can't sell food, they can't sell crafts. Those who are working to provide services to visitors are unable to do so. So you increase unemployment and you lose the community benefit we have a system of sharing revenue with the communities that are made by the parks uh, based on the money we receive, so they can't receive that. But we've also seen increased poaching and other illegal activities near and within the parks. And uh, our such activities have also been disrupted. 
Uh, next slide, please. The increased poaching is what I want to talk about very briefly. And when I'm talking about poaching, I'm looking at all illegal killing of wildlife, whether it is a small diker or an elephant. I can uh, safely say, though, we have not seen the killing of big game. Uh, most of what we have seen is what my colleagues have already mentioned, uh, bushmeat. Uh, so these incidents have increased. And the handling of suspects is a bit complex because of the need to minimize the spread of COVID. So you find the suspects are getting a lot of bail and it is difficult to uh, get them back to court, but sometimes they also go back and re-engage in uh, uh, poaching. Next slide, please. We have, uh, on the next slide, you will see a table showing uh, uh, an appreciable increase in uh, the number of uh, the, the level of poaching and suspects, the, the blue are the cases, suspects that are, have been in court in a similar period last year on the left, and this year on the right, and you automatically see that there is an increase. Why is the increase there? Uh, partly because poaching has actually increased. There are more free people who ran away from the cities that have gone to the villages and they don't have much to make an income, so they are there. But probably what most people don't appreciate is that actually we've increased our patrols. Reason is all our guides uh, who were guiding visitors in the parks, we didn't just let them sit and do nothing. We've enrolled them for uh, anti-poaching operations because they are fully trained and they can manage uh, the activity. So because of our increased patrols, we've been able to arrest more people than we were arresting before. But we also are aware that there are people who are looking at uh, generating a small income out of poaching. Next slide. Uh, this disruption of revenue, if I could talk about it briefly, is that we, the government gets 1.5 billion as foreign exchange out of tourism. All those visitors are not coming. So when you look back every month, you're losing a, a substantial amount of money that uh, would have come in, I think close to about 100 uh, million US dollars a month. That is not coming into government. UWA, on the other hand, loses about 2 million US dollars on a monthly basis. And then there is revenue generated uh, because of collaborative arrangements with the investors in these areas uh, of about 800,000 annually that uh, we are also uh, missing. Uh, next slide, please. What have we therefore done. We have prioritized the issue of protection of wildlife and the habitats, and we have prioritized the issue of human wildlife conflict mitigation. And so we've focused on those, and as you have seen, we've already seen increase in the number of uh, people we are arresting because of participating in illegal activities. But given that we are not getting a lot of revenue, we are trying to partner and collaborate and coordinate and work with all kinds of actors and friends of conservation globally to see that we have resources available that we can put back into, uh, into conservation. Uh, next slide, please. I want to conclude by looking at what strategies we think are relevant in reducing the over-reliance on tourism uh, in supporting wildlife conservation. I already told you 90% of our revenue comes from tourism. That already is a challenge. 
But what we are thinking needs to be done is that we need to look at diversifying the resources. Let's not only look at tourism. When we have excess funds, what should we do? We need to look at other things outside of tourism so that when tourism falls, uh, the other source of income props us up and we're able to survive. And then we want to engage with development partners uh, to see how we can fund some critical areas, even if we are not able to cover everything we need to do. Uh, thirdly, we need to create awareness in the communities, collaborate with them, ensure they are part and parcel of the conservation of the wildlife, because we shouldn't be arresting them if they are partners. We, they would be the eyes uh, and protecting the wildlife because they would know that when COVID is gone, they will benefit from the tourism. We also want to continue advocating for direct government funding. Ghana Life Authority, uh, for example, as I mentioned, gets all its revenue from tourism. And uh, there is very little that comes from government directly. Uh, we would like to now engage government to say, hey, can you support as we wait for tourism to grow again? And then we need to look into technologies that will help us do more with less resources. And uh, the domestic tourism in Uganda is such that our visitors in the parks are about 50% East Africans, 50% foreigners, uh, foreigners as in not East Africans. Um, and we need to work into getting more of the East Africans in, because for example, we've now reopened uh, the savannah parks, the one where we don't have great apes, uh, but we see, we still see very few people visiting as yet, uh, partly because most of our parks are at the borders and the border districts are not yet free to move in, but also partly because uh, people do not uh, value the purpose of getting out and about and relaxing. Uh, finally, I think the other issue is that all of us need to learn to develop risk plans and anticipate disasters. Uh, what we did as an organization is in the last two months, we've quickly looked at the resources we have, quickly prioritized what we are going to do. We are confident that we can run another one year or so, but on reduced activities. But we, if we had planned earlier, probably we'll do much better uh, than we are doing now. So we really need to look into this and focus ourselves, um, prioritize our operations to ensure that the core mandate of our organizations uh, continue running and we protect the wildlife. For us at Uganda Wildlife Authority, we actually say we conserve for generations. To do that, we need to be prepared. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mwanda. Uh, that was a, a good presentation and I like uh, the quote uh, on the screen now. And uh, I would like to put it uh, to our speakers uh, as our closing remarks, uh, really, uh, uh, when we get there. Uh, he's brought up uh, the question of, uh, uh, of a reliance in tourist, tourism for conservation. Uh, what do the partner states uh, think about strategies uh, for revenue diversification? I think that's a very important question that we can really um, digest on. And uh, we can, you know, as I, I know we've touched a bit on this and uh, use that our closing remarks. Uh, but right now, uh, I want us to uh, change uh, focus uh, a bit and go uh, to partners uh, who make uh, the work of uh, conservation in Africa or in East Africa for that matter uh, possible. And I will start uh, uh, with Luther uh, Anuku, uh, who is the, uh, who will be talking about the opportunities uh, for building resilient systems, landscapes, and institutions for post-COVID-19 
recovery in the East African uh, region. Uh, Luther Anukul is the regional director uh, for the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Uh, you're welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wawel, uh, for, uh, for uh, those remarks. And thank you so much, uh, first of all, all the distinguished representatives from the uh, various countries and uh, also to uh, 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 the Environment uh, Office Director, Arrera, and um, Honorable Christoph, uh, the DSG uh, EAT, uh, for uh, participating in this panel. Uh, on behalf of IUCN, I'd like and, uh, to first and foremost uh, thank all the panelists for their contribution um, during this seminar and the rich discussions that are coming out from the Q&A chat. Um, we've all talked about the impact of COVID-19 and we've looked at the fact that we've lost revenues, we have uh, lost jobs, and it's affected people at both societal but also individual level. I think one aspect I just wanted to add is the issue of time frame. This impact is certainly going to take a long time and it would require a strategic approach rather than a tactical response. I know that most of the things we are doing at the moment, not just in this sector but also other sectors, is um, of an emergency nature. But actually the impact is going to be long term and certainly does require to have a much more well thought out um, uh, approach. Um, just looking at the fact that tourism contributes from the various presentations to a very significant level of GDP in our country, the impact is certainly greater when we lose that, in, when we lose that source of revenue for low developed countries and middle income countries. And, and therefore that begs um, to the question, what will be the economic performance of these countries once that um, uh, part of revenue is lost? I mean, 8%, 10% is not small. And, uh, the second point which really has come out from the uh, discussion, which I thought was quite important, is the need to rethink our model for financing. Um, I think we talked about innovative financing. We, we have heard a lot from the various presentations. And also they need to do uh, innovative marketing. I like the fact that we're targeting the next generation. Um, we're looking at uh, local tourism. Um, I, I, I do want to just add that there is an aspect that we need to add to this marketing, and that is the real value of protected areas. The real value of protected areas goes far beyond uh, support, uh, far beyond tourism. It actually is uh, providing ecosystem services, water, fresh air, um, supporting us on the impact to climate change. Once we change that narrative, it therefore um, um, uh, brings to the fore that the investment required for protected areas needs to rise. And it shouldn't just be coming only from, um, uh, from, uh, from tourism. It has to go beyond that because of the massive benefits that protected areas actually do provide to society. And, and that needs to, to come in. Uh, and uh, apart from marketing the services, uh, and so uh, Brigadier Oil thanks a lot for that, for marketing services for the next millennials, which, which probably uh, would require apart from just a, a, a comfort, I think we're really talking about marketing nature. Because understanding the value of nature and uh, uh, will be very critical to promoting conservation for the future. And I can see that this is the big opportunity that the next generation has to really place nature and the value of nature where it belongs. And um, in terms of IUCN, uh, uh, we have been participating in a number of um, um, uh, 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 initiatives with different stakeholders. And at this stage, we are looking at both the short term and medium term. I mean, for the short term, medium term, we have been uh, working uh, in channeling resources to uh, address the emergency needs that arise out of COVID-19. I think you will have seen um, on our various websites, on our website and also various uh, sources, um, um, uh, adverts or requests for proposals um, from protected areas and also uh, civil society organizations to participate in accessing some small funds that can help mitigate short-term and medium-term measures. And I would want to encourage you uh, to, to actually visit uh, uh, those, uh, those, those particular websites and also take advantage of those resources 
that could support the short and medium term. However, for the long term, I'm proud to say that we are collaborating with the East African Community uh, Secretariat and also with, uh, with support from USID uh, to develop a new initiative to test and upscale the use of nature-based solutions to enhance the resilience of ecosystems and local communities to future shocks. And indeed, uh, the, the need for more resilience and adaptive systems has brought to the fore the sharp focus as a result of this pandemic that we need to, uh, to bring to the fore the, the, the sharp focus of this, the result of this pandemic. There's also a need for a holistic and integrated um, solutions at land and seascape level that maintain critical ecosystem services and habitats. Um, and this should really feature in the, uh, in the East Africa strategy to adapt to future challenges. And uh, I just want to say that uh, we, are, we are happy to be a part uh, of uh, uh, this uh, whole collaboration with the various countries and with the East African community. And I'd like to end by just thanking and congratulating the ESC for putting together this excellent webinar and also for the support from USID, uh, Kenya and East Africa. Uh, in, in uh, ensuring that this collaboration actually works. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, um, Mr. Luda and Anuku, uh, Director uh, from the region uh, IUCN uh, for those uh, great remarks. And uh, we'll now hear from uh, Aurelia uh, Miko, uh, who is the Inform Environment Office Director for USAID Kenya and East Africa, uh, who will be, you know, uh, uh, reacting or uh, reverting into some of the presentations and also looking into the post-COVID-19 recovery opportunities in the wildlife conservation and tourism sectors. You're much welcome, uh, Aurelia. Thank you so very much and uh, good morning, good afternoon uh, to all of you. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, uh, just thank you, right? Thank you very much for, for a great facilitation, but thank you very much for the leadership that uh, East African community is showing in, in pulling this together, in uh, getting um, everyone to share um, their experiences, share their recovery plans, um, share what they're um, experiencing and doing on the ground in order to address uh, um, the, the COVID situation and the post-COVID recovery. So thank you all of you for, for, for the great presentations and, and thank you to the East African community again for their leadership in, in pulling this together. I just wanted to say a few words and um, uh, we uh, so we introduced an IUCN in order to support and that could help us continue a more collaborative dialogue on the value. Africa. So that's the that's the broad uh, with the leadership of the policy leadership uh, from the uh, from the East African community. Um, and so the the one thing I wanted to to mention uh, so a couple things I wanted to mention so you know uh, clearly all of you in your presentations uh, have outlined the massive disruptions that uh, that COVID uh, um, and uh, has had on the wildlife sector and clearly uh, the massive drop in tourism which is a major revenue source. Hello. Can I continue? Uh, stay connected with me so that I can hear them. You? Um, uh, uh, Stefano, Sorry, if you could a, mute a all of us. Speaker that's speaking yeah. over me. Yes, uh, although you're also breaking, I, I don't know if it's your internet connection or uh, it's just, you know, from all, all of us. Can we all hear Aurelia? Okay, uh, you can continue. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, you know, clearly we've all seen and experienced, and many of you have talked to, about that in your presentations, um, the, uh, the massive drop in tourism as a result of COVID and what it's done to both the budgets of the, of the organization or the resources that, that are flowing to both communities, landowners and, and the private sector. So we, and, and clearly recovery is paramount. To, and a quick recovery ideally 
paramount. And we've seen in a couple of these presentations, uh, especially the presentation from EAC, is that recovery might be something that that's a you know to recover um, some of the revenue might take us uh, um, you know even to the trees. And I think uh, you know, uh, and I think, but. Uh, I do think that uh, EAC and all of your agencies are playing a critical role in that in that as we are entering into the, the Q&A period and, I, and I'm looking at the many questions that are coming up in the Q&A it is clear that there is a greater role in as we're talking about the recovery you know figuring out how we uh, as a sector recover better and um, how do we make uh, this sector more resilient to future shocks like this to future um, to future uh, um, Shocks that impact revenue sources that have a negative impact on wildlife uh, that have a natural capital in general. So, um, this, this private sector, what role does the private sector play in long term recovery? you know, as a source of revenue, but how do we engage the, been really uh, trying to push, uh, apologies, I don't understand why this is, um, someone else has stopped my video, so I, uh, I apologize for that, um, but uh, in the long term recovery, how do we embrace the private sector, what role do they have, a major assessment in Amara, for example, talking to Avery, so that embracing the private Hello, Aurelia. Can you hear me? Hello. Um, but also embracing the domestic area. I can hear you. Y yes, uh, you're breaking up, and that's why we have uh, removed uh, your video uh, to see if we are able to get you well. Uh, but for me, uh, from my side, you're breaking up. Uh, I don't know if it's for all the participants. Yes, uh, I see from uh, fellow panelists. Are uh, you breaking up? Uh, I don't know if we ask a couple of questions and then we come to you later. Uh, okay. Would that be okay? If you okay. don't mind. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, lady and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much uh, for those engaging uh, uh, presentations, uh, which you've seen, uh, of course, uh, globally facing the common enemy and more so for the East African region. And there are so many questions uh, you know, that are being addressed how we can work you know, together regionally. Uh, but I can just uh, read a couple um, and I'll mention uh, the ones that have been uh, you know, directed to uh, any one of you. And I'll go first to uh, Brigadier Wawero uh, from Peter Mirori uh, here in Kenya. He's asking, are there plans uh, by the Kenyan government to increase budgetary allocations for wildlife conservation efforts since a global tourism has uh, collapsed. And uh, I think another question also, also directed to you um, is could you, uh, no, no, uh, that one will come to later. Is there any possibility for the development of cross-border conservation plans and policies to address common regional conservation problems? Uh, I think this one we can hear from you, uh, Director from Kenya Wildlife Service and also from Honorable Christophe. Thank you. Sorry, uh, namesake, can you repeat the question again? Sorry. Uh, the first one is, are there plans uh, by the Kenyan government to increase budgetary allocations for wildlife conservation efforts since global tourism has collapsed, as we have uh, already seen from the presentations? Yes, uh, indeed there is. Um, I think if you are following the news in the last uh, few weeks, I think it's a week and a half ago, the, uh, the government allocated uh, 2 billion shillings uh, towards uh, conservation. And how they did that is 1 billion is to go to the development and enhancement of uh, community conservancies. Uh, and this, Kenya, although the money is allocated to Kenya Wildlife Service, it will be, we will work with the, the Kenya Wildlife Conservation Association to be able to build the capacities of uh, conservancies to be able to look after themselves and build uh, their efforts towards conservation. The second part, uh, uh, we've got another one billion 
And this is going to be allocated to the next financial year, which is like uh, in the next few weeks, uh, is uh, towards uh, the recruitment of uh, game scouts for those conservancies. Uh, these game scouts will be for the conservancies. There's 160 of them, as I had mentioned in my presentation when I started off. And uh, we are going to sit down again with the KWCA, Kenya Wildlife uh, Conservation Association, which is the overarching body, uh, so that we can then be able to see how to structure the recruitment and the training. The training will be carried out by Kenya Wildlife Service. Uh, because we are the ones with the facility to be able to do that, but it will be on behalf of these conservancies so that we can then be able to give them the capacity uh, to have those, those uh, uh, scouts work within their conservation areas. So yes, the government has uh, uh, actually um, uh, provided for the conservancies to be able to enhance this given the situation of the uh, COVID-19. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the elaborate answer. Uh, before you go, uh, there are other questions like three of seen related to your presentation on technology. You've said uh, we have now to look at uh, technology. Someone is asking how uh, do we go about this with limited funds? I think your answer probably answers that, uh, but also they want to know, uh, and also from other speakers, uh, are we looking for, if this persists, uh, are we looking for virtual tourism, um, usage of drones, uh, that's a question I got, uh, or how uh, are we looking into adapting this new normal, so to speak? Yes, uh, I can give you two uh, quick answers. First, about virtual tourism. I believe if you are looking at uh, Instagram or maybe Facebook, uh, a week and a half ago, my uh, cabinet secretary, the, the minister for tourism and, uh, and wildlife, and myself, were in the Nairobi National Park, and uh, we were actually, uh, together with Kenya Tourism Board, launching the virtual tourism platform. And that is being handled by Kenya Tourism Board, which is a partner uh, uh, organization within the Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife. So yes, that is a, a we are, we are learning from our brothers and sisters in South Africa to be able to do that uh, where it's already working and we are seeing that as an opportunity uh, to be able to do so. Uh, the, the other was the, uh, just remind me please kindly, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, I, I think you, the, the other one was uh, how do we do this with limited funding? But, but I guess yes, yes, your yes. previous question, Te question technology, answered. Technology, yeah. we'll talk about technology. Technology, yeah. yes, we are going to involve um, uh, the use of drones, uh, that is something that we're moving towards uh, uh, shortly, uh, maybe within the next financial year, before the end of the financial year, we want to deploy that. But that's mainly uh, on uh, the issue of security. Obviously, uh, we will have to make do with the, the, the force that we have, which uh, I should say, or I dare say, uh, is not, we're not have a big enough force to be able to cover the entire, all our parks. Uh, because we are, we are fewer than we, we wish to be. We wish we were more. But when you have the use of drones, particularly for law enforcement uh, and uh, uh, anti-poaching uh, uh, operations, then that will help us enhance uh, the way in which we operate. And we will be able to actually, with a smaller force, be able to do more. Additionally, in the training of uh, rangers, we are also looking at multi-skilling our rangers so that they have more than just the skill of tracking and, uh, and uh, wildlife protection. They, they get additional skills within uh, uh, our training uh, academy. So, yes, this is how we see ourselves using technology and many other forms of technology because the other, the other areas also we want to enhance. Uh, we're getting uh, with, with our partners support from WWF where we get uh, equipment that helps us to be able to uh, conduct our operations even better. So yes, we are going to be using technology significantly. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, again, uh, Brigadier John Wawero. And um, uh, there was a question for uh, Christophe, um, Honorable Christophe. Uh, I think he's back, uh, but before I raise that question again, uh, I would like to, yes, yes, uh, here it is. Um, 
Uh, this is a unique question uh, that I'll put to the, the East African community uh, through Honorable Christophe, and it comes from South Sudan, uh, which uh, unfortunately is not uh, represented uh, from uh, in country here. Uh, but we have Chan Paul Amor, a journalist at a community radio in South Sudan, uh, who is, uh, can someone describe the situation of tourism, wildlife conservation in South Sudan? Particularly, I would like to see what improvements have been made in ESC to strengthen South Sudan as well. Uh, Honorable uh, Christophe. Yeah, thank you, uh, moderator. I wish to say that uh, since the time uh, South Sudan has come on board, ESC has uh, actually developed a uh, kind of uh, how to fast track integration of uh, South Sudan in the ESC process. And uh, this uh, uh, roadmap actually is the one also being implemented. And among the uh, uh, issues which has been handled was to bring South Sudan on board, especially in the organs of inst and institutions of the East African community, including the court, the East African Legislative Assembly, so that member and even in the secretariat, so that uh, uh, members from uh, the Sudanese community can actually be following exactly what is happening uh, on the ground in East Africa and then participate uh, actively in uh, meetings where we are speaking about uh, uh, integration and how we move together uh, towards actually the East African community integration. And then when it comes to meetings, you know, we, we try to do everything on a rotational basis. And uh, in all meetings, we have uh, South Sudan represented, being in the Council of Ministers, being at the level of sectoral councils of ministers, being at uh, the heads of state level, uh, like uh, what I have said uh, recently, last uh, uh, month on 12th, we had a consultative meeting of the summit heads of state and the South Sudan was uh, uh, represented by uh, he, he, His Excellency, the President of South Sudan. So they are part and uh, party in the process of integration. And uh, this actually uh, uh, is uh, in the process we have put in place to fast track integration of, of South Sudan. And meetings are also held in South Sudan. Uh, being technical meetings or the decision uh, making me, me meetings. So to say, uh, the focus is to try, like to bring uh, South Sudan on board, like in the customs area, trainings have been there and uh, also uh, uh, infrastructure has been put in place, like in Juba, we have also this video conference so that whenever we have to meet online, we can meet and uh, be uh, having South Sudan on board. So we, we, we are saying South Sudan in all areas of integration has been brought on board. And uh, uh, of course, it cannot be uh, at the same level as people have been there for the last 10 years, uh, the last 20 years. So the idea is they are there. We are trying to move together and we bring South Sudan on board in all levels, and they are actually uh, participating uh, in all activities of the community. This is one answer I can give. And of course, I have to say, there are many areas where they are not well advanced because of the time when they have joined, but uh, we are conscious of that, and we try actually uh, to, to, to push forward so that we can uh, uh, have them on board. And of course, if we say that at the East African community level we are trying, we are also frustrated by, by the fact that we are not moving well as we wish, not only with South Sudan, but in the whole community. We are not moving with the speed we wish to have. But whichever case, you are still performing well, based in the, uh, among the eight regional economic community uh, in Africa when it comes to integration. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Christophe Mazivamo, uh, for that answer. I'm all from South Sudan. I hope that answers uh, your question. And uh, before you go, Honorable Christophe, uh, there is a question here 
uh, um, that, that is coming from Jaconia Otieno uh, in Kenya. And a similar question from Bijabin Jumbe uh, from uh, Uganda. And the question is, um, it's a bit tough on you. Is it really viable for the region to come together on conservation, given that it's very difficult to agree on how to handle COVID-19 in the first place? And Jube uh, adds to that, uh, why is it hard uh, for countries in the region to conduct a joint marketing strategy? Why not market ESC as a block? And uh, after Honorable Christophe answers, you can kindly raise your hand uh, if you also, uh, any other panelists, if you want to delve into that. And so good to have your area back. I uh, will uh, we'll, uh, uh, let you uh, give us the closing remarks kindly after we're done with the questions. So thank you, moderator. Let me say that uh, integration is a process. And uh, the first step is uh, commitment. Our partner states have committed, and this is through the treaty for the establishment of the East African community, and also different protocols which have been ratified in this partner state, including the protocol on customs, uh, union, the protocol on common market, uh, the protocol on monetary union, and yet we are moving towards a political federation. And there we say it is not good to jump quickly to a political federation. Let's move through a confederation. And all partner states have agreed to move through a confederation. And now they have put in place, let's say, two experts in constitutional uh, matters to work together towards coming later on with an East African community confederation constitution. So we are expecting to have a report from them. So in the treaty, we speak about collaboration, complementarity, cooperation. And there are a number of articles under this treaty, including 114 and 116, which are pushing partner states to work together in the field of wildlife management, conservation, and also tourism. And here, I wish to tell you that uh, all these partner states, six, have already agreed on having a, a, a common uh, East Africa tourism and wildlife management protocol. Recently, they have adopted one on uh, environmental management, a protocol. So for all ministers in charge of East uh, in, in East Africa, in charge of tourism and wildlife management have agreed. And the, 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 the protocol is awaiting to be concluded with the, summit, uh, the, the Council of Ministers and then the summit. But the ministers in charge of tourism have already agreed on that how to move together. And in this protocol, they speak also about marketing East Africa as a common destination, especially, of course, respecting some uh, particularities like uh, national identities. Uh, but whatever case, they have agreed on having a common protocol where the East African community is to be marketed as one single tourism destination. And now we are developing a tourism uh, marketing strategy, original one. This one has been discussed. It was also agreed, agreed upon by all ministers in charge of tourism. But later on, they have requested for further consultations. And now we are waiting to come up, maybe in the next meeting of uh, ministers, to come up with a version containing the COVID issue, because this came later. And this meeting is planned to be uh, uh, at the beginning of July, because it was planned to be in this month, but it has been actually uh, some preparatory meetings were postponed because of these uh, uh, different pro pro problems we have been having uh, in the region, like the death of the president of Burundi, and also the swearing in ceremony, which was planned on 18. Uh, uh, of this month in, uh, in Burundi. So this has stopped these preparatory meetings to conclude, but they are postponed actually to happen. Uh, in what I okay. wish to say is, what I wish to say is 
there is a commitment to work together. Of course, because the principle of working together is based on uh, consensus, where everyone has to agree before we move forward, but we say it is better to move slowly and be sure we sustain achievement than moving very quickly and maybe uh, later on uh, destroy what we have achieved. So this is the way you are moving. The commitment is there. And in this process of conservation, there is already some achievement milestones which all partner states have agreed upon. So I am uh, optimistic. They uh, avoid to be pessimistic. Actually, we are moving slowly but surely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, that we should all be optimistic and indeed it would be good to see you know having a common you know agenda for the conservation of our nature and planet and uh, i would like to come to you uh, eugene as a wildlife conservation um expert uh, there are many questions that i think to ask as one uh, how how is the public sector uh working to bring in the private sector and do you uh, believe or think uh, that uh, the private sector is important um, in, in joining forces with the public sector uh, post-COVID-19 to see recovery of the tourism and the conserv conservation sphere. Eugene? Uh, thank you so much. Um, for example, um, in Rwanda, uh, we've learned uh, various lessons when it comes to pandemic. And uh, one of the ways is to actually find other ways of, uh, you know, bridging the gap or avoiding future scenarios coming and hitting us seriously. Depending only on uh, tourism uh, revenue generated is actually a single source, uh, which is not an ideal. And uh, integrating uh, uh, private sector is, uh, is, is one thing that uh, we are focusing on to, to actually uh, uh, lo look at uh, ways of um, uh, starting to, to engage private sector. And this had started, um, I will give an example, uh, uh, working with um, business, uh, uh, business uh, uh, se se section, uh, in Rwanda in particular, we had started on uh, uh, projects with uh, wilderness safaris. Wilderness safaris uh, is, uh, uh, they operate, they operate uh, uh, tourism businesses in, uh, through lodges. And uh, through park expansion, for example, uh, financing these huge uh, uh, projects, we, we had started uh, on a pilot project of expanding Volcanoes National Park together. Uh, though the pandemic came and uh, uh, hit the business, but it's one thing that uh, we would uh, count on uh, in, in case uh, actually um, uh, uh, other sources through government tourism uh, revenues uh, are not working out. We had also started on, uh, with them in Gishwati, uh, a management concession, tourism concession, uh, and we had started on uh, with them um, we signed a contract uh, uh, a year back uh, of managing the short tourism, and uh, they, they had started on uh, habituating uh, uh, chimpanzees. And uh, we found it, uh, this is because government normally, uh, there are no available resources to invest in such uh, developments. So engaging private sector is, is an ideal because normally they have, uh, they look at it as in a business uh, uh, angle. And, and of which uh, governments uh, should uh, borrow from. Um, so uh, though we have no um, so, so much uh, uh, cases to, to, to present, uh, but it's an ideal, it's, uh, it's a plan that we are, we are buying, it's a plan that we want to embark on and uh, look at the ways of uh, involving private sector and other uh, recovery plans like um, uh, also uh, uh, conservation trust funds that uh, would be a source of funding in case uh, the pandemic like this come up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eugene Mchangana from Rwanda Development Board uh, for that answer. And I want to believe the same uh, for all the countries I represented here are in dealing from the East African community. Uh, Mr. Samwanda, 
there are so many questions uh, related to poaching and uh, from your presentation. Um, uh, but but uh, even before you answer that, you know, like uh, uh, the one question is looking at uh, uh, the jail terms. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Uh, but another question that I would like to actually bring it as one is that uh, we've had, um, although it's not been confirmed, uh, that uh, the coronavirus has emanated from wildlife, um, a wildlife animal, and uh, basically how we relate uh, with uh, wild animals, the environment. Uh, what is uh, your thoughts, you know, and what can we as a wildlife uh, authorities uh, do uh, to, to make sure that uh, we, uh, we prevent uh, future zoonotic diseases? Uh, you're on mute, sir. Always, always difficult to remember to unmute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Aweru. Um, jail terms for offenders in Uganda depend on a number of issues. Uh, it relates to how the case is brought before court, what evidence is available, whether this is a first offense or it's an offense that has, is being repeated, uh, and so on. So there are many things that relate to this, uh, and so it depends. But I could just uh, read for you the law here. Uh, there are many things that I could read, but let me read. In the case of a first offender, to a fine not exceeding 350 currency points. Uh, that would be talking about, I think, 2,000 US dollars, uh, uh, or to a term of impros imprisonment not exceeding 10 years or both. Now that's for a first offender. Anything beyond that is much more and the biggest uh, sentence provides for a life imprisonment for uh, poaching of protected species. So the, the offenses, the, the jail terms for offenses, they are higher, the more uh, the species is considered important, but also the more frequent you have been arrested. Um, and this is a new law that uh, came into operation last year. And so it's already being utilized. We're already working with partners to uh, provide information to the magistrates and judges so that they can implement it appropriately. Uh, the second aspect of the question was with corona, uh, likely to have come from wildlife. Uh, how do we ensure that we prevent this? I think there are uh, many ways in which uh, we need to handle this. I think one of the biggest questions we should be asking ourselves is uh, how do we uh, prevent illegal wildlife trade? Because it's normally the illegal wildlife trade that ends up into being a problem as people are trying to hide the fact that they have this wildlife uh, and they are living in closed quarters and probably transporting it uh, badly and handling it badly, then you have a disease, a zoonotic disease jumping from the wildlife into humans. And so we should look at that. But secondly, we need to be focused on uh, creating awareness among the population. Um, most of the people living next to our protected areas are poor. They are so poor that uh, there is a big problem in how they relate to the wildlife, ending up poaching and hunting and trying to eat the bushmeat and uh, uh, some of them trying to uh, capture this wildlife and sell it for some income. And so, there is a, a possibility of transmission in any of those activities. And, and so we need to engage the local communities and let them 
indicator where that we need to be careful uh, and that they endanger their own lives in the lives of the whole humanity if they uh, mismanage the way they handle the wildlife. Uh, I saw somewhere on the Q&A, somebody asking uh, whether we will revive the uh, friendly gorilla that we had some years back. Uh, I just wanted to let the individual know. I think it is Gerard Tenua of the New Vision that um, we actually had discussions with the potential partner to see how that can be revived uh, as a way of facilitating, the, facilitating those who cannot travel to Uganda to look at a gorilla, to actually be able to see gorillas wherever they are more closely, even if it will be remote. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Monda, for your elaborate answers and that indeed we need to find a way uh, to stop illegal wildlife crime. Although many questions are asking, even with these punitive laws, like the new one you have in Uganda, Kenya has a punitive law. Why do we get you know, less uh, prosecutions? Uh, but even though uh, people have been arrested, uh, but, but we've seen even uh, the masterminds being uh, let go. I, I think that's a conversation uh, for another day. I think that we over one hour mark and uh, I had said that we'll give you um, uh, closing remarks. I, I don't think uh, we able to do that now. And with your permission, uh, I will give it to Oleria Miko uh, from USAID, Kenya and East Africa uh, to give us uh, the closing remarks. Mo moderator. You yes, uh, DJ. Hello. Yes, uh, I, I want to keep I want to keep my promise of uh, having said that I would provide you figures. Oh, the figures, yes. Yes, please. Particularly uh, on bushmeat. Uh, between uh, January and May 2019, we recovered uh, 1.8 tons of bushmeat uh, wow. that was illegally poached. And uh, the same period between January and May, 2020, we have recovered 2.8 uh, tons. So you're talking about a, a, an increase of about 51.4%. So I wanted to give those figures so that you, at least you understand the kind yeah, sure. of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the kind of problem we're facing at the moment. Thank you. Oh yeah. Sorry oh, yeah. for- I, it, It's good before you go, uh, that's a very good statistic. Uh, and at least it gives the reporters uh, a perspective of the problem that we're facing. Uh, related to that, do we have any arrests and prosecutions on the same? Yes, indeed we do. We have uh, uh, arrested um, the culprits and actually have taken them through to court. We do that. And uh, that is done on a regular basis whenever we arrest them. Uh, as far as the... Uh, the problem really, and I mentioned it during my presentation, is the market. If we do not target the market, even if we do arrest the culprits who actually do uh, the, the poaching, we will not be able to solve the problem. So our target is the market. And we have been uh, targeting these markets uh, sometime last year, uh, the beginning of, I mean, the middle of last year, we were actually able to do a raid in Bama market and we were that the 1.8 tons that I was talking about, uh, a significant amount of that was actually uh, picked up at Bama Market. And since then, we have seen a great reduction in bush meat being sold in such outlets. So yes, they do get arrested. Yes, we take them to court. And we also do raids to the market uh, in those areas. I hope that helps. Uh, yeah. It does help. It does help. Thank you so much. Oh, Aurelia has left. So as you are looking for mm -hmm. her, let me tell you that uh, maybe participant go uh, back home could be uh, benefiting from the decisions which have been taken at regional level. Because most recently, ministers in charge of finance have met at the East African community level view, view uh, through a video conference. And they have actually committed 
committed to implement some kind of fiscal and monetary measures to help protect jobs, sustain companies' liquidity and operations, relief funding to assist SMEs in the tourism and hospitality sector who are under uh, threat in this period due to the imposed travel restrictions and mitigation plan for various players in the industry. This is a commitment which has been taken at regional level by ministers in charge of finance. So at home, in partner states, it is good maybe you follow up and see how you can benefit from these decisions so that the finance ministries can help in that process. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, uh, I was in, on mute. Uh, Aurelia has, uh, unfortunately, I think she had uh, connection issues and she's left. Uh, so I think uh, with uh, uh, your permission, our panelists, uh, we will bring it to an end here. Uh, allow us please to share your presentations uh, to the participants, is that okay? And there are so many, many questions uh, that we have uh, not mentioned. Uh, of answered and what we do is uh, we tried to you know run it by them and we do hope you're able to answer and then we can share uh, with all the people that have registered and we had a very big number uh, from east africa uh, uh, to africa and the rest of the world and uh, thank you so much uh, again uh, for you know giving us time from your busy schedules and for giving us you know such a high level uh, from the leadership of the East African community. Uh, we don't take this for granted. Uh, we, we're very grateful. And uh, uh, wh what I can say is that uh, uh, this uh, webinar uh, was made possible uh, with financial support from USAID uh, through the Connect project, which, which is led by IUCN in collaboration with the uh, East African community, Traffic and WWF. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, my name is Kyondo Waweru. I work for Internews as Journalism Network, uh, which has a network of about 9,000 uh, journalists across the world. And we try to empower, you know, train and connect them to resources and experts and uh, word of a panel like you for them to be able uh, to report uh, on these uh, issues of wildlife conservation. And we'll be uploading uh, shortly uh, the webinar a recording on our website at adjournalism.net and we'll also share with all the partners IUCN, uh, UWA, KWS, Rwanda Development um, Board and also uh, with ESC so that we can share with your networks. Again, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you tune from in. It's bye-bye for now. <laughs>